rather reassured me in, in something that you wrote, which is, at the moment that one is actually in attunement, we're not really consciously aware of that attunement. In, in other words, we cannot be in one place where we're objectively saying, I am experiencing a, a, attunement, and at the same time experiencing attunement. That when we are one, there's no conscious awareness of it, but it's when we seem to come out of that state of consciousness that we experience this in-flooding illumination, this, this ecstasy. I, is that correct? Yes, that's right, because uh, in the state of meditation, you are merging yourself. You are merging yourself. Now, when you can relate particular sensations and feelings, you are not merged. You are then an individual again. So the response of the great euphoria and feeling you have is when you are drawing back from the, the mystical attunement and then you feel this surge and, and this great sensation, then self is a, has beginning to again assert itself but, and respond, you see. So therefore, um, perhaps we could say that with the purpose of meditation is to experience this oneness so that we might have a reorientation of our viewpoint. And when we come out of meditation with this in-flooding illumination and so on, we indeed experience this reorientation where all of a sudden we have insight where there was blindness. We have illumination where there was darkness. We have guidance where there was chaos. So therefore, we don't need to pray or we don't need to meditate on a problem. That one of the spin-offs of meditation is we get the answers we need after experiencing well, that oneness. Is this... What do yes, you think? Well, well, what happens there from the practical, pragmatic point of view? The person says, well, all right, what does it mean to you? It's a reorganization of your thoughts, a rejuvenation of your whole mental processes. In other words, you think clearly, uh, things that you th were vague and dark seem to drop away. Uh, you have an intuitive impression, an intuitive enlightenment. And enlightenment means uh, a gnosis, new ideas come to you, or new wisdom. And uh, you feel an uplift, a, a moral strength and a mental strength to carry on. That's the practical end of it. That's the practical end of it. And in other words, if the individual, when he returns again to self, had no advantages in it, he would not do it at all. He would not do it at all. So there are practical advantages, otherwise than just being feel like you're floating in space. That has no particular advantage. But you find that you have a power, a confidence, a self-confidence, and the things that inhibited you seem to have fallen away. Okay, so now we get to answering part of the, the, the conflict that I mentioned at the beginning of the program, that we do live in a very physical, very active, very material world. And we have this tendency to want to deal in this material world. Yet at the same time, we have this instinctive urge for something a little more mystical, more spiritual. So, there are some practical benefits to, to meditation or to the experience of mysticism. What, what have you experienced as, as practical benefits? Well, in the first place, ordinarily, we are imprisoned today, uh, objectively, by the demands made upon ourselves by society and the world we live in. We are physical beings, we're living in a physical world, we've got to adjust to it. But we have many times say to ourselves, if I only had some spark or some idea what to do, if I, if I wasn't so depressed, if I, if I could find that I had some strength, some insight, something to look forward to other than being wrapped up and captive in, in the, my social conditions and so on. Well, that is the practical advantage that you get. You are, well, to use, it's not a religious, it's a religious term, but I'm not using that sense. You are reborn in the sense that your vital powers, your mental powers and so on, are rejuvenated and given a new outlook. And uh, that perhaps also that we experience a greater integration, a greater unifying of ourselves as you're saying, we're less torn apart, we're less at conflict. And if we have that kind of unification, all that energy that went into the conflict can now be directed into more creative That's channels. right. You have something to work with, you have new tools. You may, why don't you may use a crude comparison between meditation and a brown study. A person will sometimes start studying something, purely objective, subjective, reasoning about it and so on, thinking and so on. Then finally he'll lose himself, so he's not aware of where he is and what he's doing. And when he comes back, he's got a clear idea. He's an influx of thought, which is not necessarily the result, result of his reason, because what ideas he gets, he can't exactly tie down, that's because I reasoned it this way. Actually, he got into a state of meditation. See? He lost himself in, in there and came back, and then he had this influx of ideas, which he thinks is an outgrowth of his reason. 
It wasn't. His reason was merely, say, a mechanical, subjective process that got him moving up in consciousness. We uh, can then, and I'm sure you, I mean, you're, you're, you're a very prolific writer, you're, very, you're the executive director of a, a major uh, corporation, if we can call it that. Obviously, this must have been a benefit to you to get all the work done that you do. You, you must indeed have found some benefit from, from these techniques in a practical sense. Um, I think this other thing that we're all seeking, this greater sense of, of oneness, that gets us over into the mystical benefits of, of the use of meditation and the pursuit of mysticism. This, uh, I know that something that you said in, in one of your articles was that we finally begin to experience infinite potential, this knowledge that, that there is an infinite potential in us. Can, can you elaborate on the, on the really mystical well, benefits? Let me, uh, if I may, mention a couple of experiences I've had. As a young person, starting first with the organization, I was studying mysticism. I had had philosophy, but I was studying mysticism, uh, I will say, from the intellectual point of view. I had I'd read about the mystical experience. I had never had, what well, honestly, a mystical experience. But I remember one day, I was walking along the street, not particularly thinking of any one thing. I don't know where I was going when suddenly it was an experience of great euphoria, a peace, it was a complete calmness. It was that type of the mystical experience, a complete calmness. I was completely lifted up and felt, I knew I was conscious where I was at that time, but it was a complete surge, research, surge of, of, of peace and uh, a strength. No idea, no idea about it. But another time, I was studying on a, both on a philosophical and mystical principle and uh, dealing, dealing with, uh, if I may use the term, what is the human soul, strictly from an analytical point of view? Well, it was a profound, complex subject, and uh, suddenly uh, it just opened up, just opened up, complete. In other words, a complete self-evident idea to me. Now, I don't mean that I am, my idea was correct, I don't mean the idea would be accepted by everybody, but to me it was self-evident. Self now that's all illumination can mean. Your illumination is not necessarily universal. And it doesn't make difference, it's universal. So long as it's self-evident to you, and no one can refute it, it's truth to you. And that's what you're seeking. And, and two, I think part of the spin-offs, I'm not going to presume to, to say that I've had the mystical experience. I, I've had the privilege of having touched sort of on the edges of the experience, but something that has happened to me is that when I experience this oneness, Mr. Lewis, you know, it's, it's very hard for me now to be unkind, as unkind to people as I have been in the past. It's very hard for me to have, uh, to, to bring war to my neighbor. And perhaps that this is this internal thing that we're all seeking, is that there is something larger than we are and we are all part of it. We are all this larger thing. And when that truth becomes self-evident, when that truth manifests itself and becomes truth to us, life changes. The whole world changes. That's true. Well, it's with you, with you at all times. Let's think of a keyboard. Let's suppose that uh, a keyboard was covered up, except just the lower octaves. And a person was playing on that all the time. He said, well, that's, that's all there is to it. Somebody suddenly takes the cloth away, and there's that whole keyboard that's been there all the time, and he plays on it as a new world. And the beautiful, much more yeah. beautiful one. Well. Mr. Lewis, let me ask you, and 